Hi, I'm Anna Spencer. Uh, today we're going to talk about constructing buildings uh, sustainably. And we have I have two guests with me who are both women who know a lot about building buildings and doing so sustainably. Uh, here in Toronto is Sandra Lee Lester, who's made kind of a career of advising architects how to uh, do the do things better. And uh, we're going to talk about her work and I think a publication that she's just done, but I haven't got the background on that yet. And she's going to have to explain more. In uh, Montreal is Claire Adamson, who is a retired uh, architect and uh, who's also concerned with sustainable construction. So good morning, ladies. How are you? Good morning. Bye. I'd like to start by asking Sandra about her new book. Is that okay with you, Claire? If sure. Okay. So I have a couple of books coming out in 2022. Um, the first one is a, a story um, about a project that I worked on several years ago, uh, the Fogo Island Inn. And in that story, I talk about um, uh, values-based decision-making and looking beyond the building itself and, and looking at the impact of decisions during the design process and how they help build a more resilient and thriving organization and how they um, build up and create a more resilient and thriving community. And my interest around that is that um, I, I've found over my career is that people make decisions kind of on a myopic level. They don't see the bigger picture. And it's been my um it's been my opportunity to help other people think out of the box and, and look at the impact of their decision making, um, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. So that's, hmm. that's kind of the thrust of, of that publication that's coming out. I want to stir people's minds and, and uh, think about um, how they're going to, um, you know, even run their company a little bit differently um, after reading it. Okay, what's the second publication? Um, this, the second one is a handbook for um, homeowners that are uh, looking to renovate their house. Mm -hmm. So guiding them all the way through um, the decision-making process of, you know, how big is this renovation that we're going to do to, um, you know, how do we, how do we um, maintain, you know, go into the main maintenance mode on, on our building, right? So um, I... I renovated my own home over a period of nine and a half years and brought it from an F energy rating to a, an A. And uh, you know it, I, I know what the experience is like, you know, being a homeowner on a tight budget and, you know, really caring about your renovation. I found it confusing for myself. You know, I'm a certified sustainable building advisor, a lead accredited professional, and now I'm a certified passive house designer. And I found it confusing you know, walk into Home Depot, you try and buy a toilet, there's a million decisions to make. So I just wanted to make it easier for homeowners. Oh, that's a neat idea. Now, uh, you say in the, the first book is more like a case study of one, one particular renovation or design process, and that and that these uh, at various stages, different decisions were made that were fateful. Uh, can, can you uh, talk a little bit about some examples of that? Favorite example, Meta, is when uh, we were trying to make a decision about the, the siding used for the building. And this is a, um, just to give a little bit of context, this is was a major construction project in a very tiny island off the island of Newfoundland. So with, you know, basically little tiny towns on this island, um, it was going to be a, a like I said, a, a, a very large project for, for the scale of the town. And um, the, the architect Todd Saunders had take, taken um, uh, Newfoundland architecture and been really inspired by it. So we wanted the exterior of the building to reflect that, that um, small town, kind of like a fishing stage. Um, if you know what a Newfoundland fish, fishing stage is, well, imagine this on, on steroids and it's almost five stories tall. Mm. Um, so we were looking at siding for the building and the architects had done a lot of work in Newfoundland. We had local architects that were 
um, signing off on it called Lap 49, fabulous architecture firm in, in Newfoundland. And um, they had found all kinds of like prefabricated siding materials. One of them had, was made regionally in the Maritimes. It contained local um, recycled content. So it was checking all these boxes for your standard green building certification process. Um, but then the client stepped in and he was using one of the, the anchors that I had helped them create on the, in the design process of, you know, what would be best for the community on this. And um, they were talking about using local wood. And this was a large building. Like what happens if you put wood on the siding as siding on the building? Well, you're going to have to paint it. It's going to require a lot of maintenance. Yeah. But a lot of the local people are unemployed. So that what would have been seen as a downfall in most uh, decision making on a project, this one was actually a benefit because they were providing jobs for people in the community. So it's kind of looking at that. It's almost like that old school, you know, when Alcan would go into Quebec in 19. 10 or the 1800s and they would build their own factory and their own community and schools for that community Mm -hmm. and they would be responsible for the whole community Mm -hmm. almost like having that effect Mm -hmm. on on a a building right so in this case the building was created by a local charity called Shorefast Foundation and they were really looking at taking the money and transforming the community it was going to be owned by the community after it was built. So this side effect of, you know, choosing this siding that required a lot of maintenance mm-hmm. is actually going to be a benefit. So it's kind of like, mm-hmm. how do you take your thinking and flip it? Right. Okay, and- let me flip it. Now, let me play with what you just said, because as you were going along, I've only been in Newfoundland once. And the one thing that I remember noticing is that there's just no trees. I didn't see a tree for hundreds of miles. Now, there, I, I suppose there are places in Newfoundland with lots of forests, but I didn't see them. And what I'm thinking is you took some of those, if there was even one tree, I don't remember seeing it, but you cut down Newfoundland's trees. Are you sure you should have done that? Yeah, but- so that that was part of the fight in our, in our thinking process too, where, we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we got some uh, Forest Stewardship Council certified wood to put on this project? Well, there aren't any FSC certified forests in Newfoundland. So then it comes down to, okay, how do we make a decision about this that reflects um, our values as much as possible? And there was a, a forest that's managed by a, a a family and has been for generations just down the road from the inn and they had their own mill and we decided to buy from them. And then basically the, the money um, selling that, that they would have made selling the, the inn, the wood to build it. um, They were going to put into forestry management and making sure that there was enough wood for when the, the siding needed to be replaced in probably 15 years, right? Okay. So, but now so it's I, a local management situation. There are forests in Newfoundland. Don't, there don't worry. There are. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, why, why are there no trees in, in uh, St. John? Oh, that's a pretty barren uh, outpost area. Like that's that's a pretty Why? barren area. What's the matter there? Is it wind or I don't? I I never bothered to try to find out, but I do remember thinking this is a, not a. I didn't think it's a very pleasant place because there are no trees. Well, it is called the Rock, but in the north there's lots of trees, um, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, there's uh, they grow fast too. The latest thing in green building is. Everything in wood, even the structure, really thick pieces of wood, solid. So if, the, if there's a fire, they uh, just char on the outside and they uh, stay there. Right. Okay. Let's talk about that because I, I've been trying to get a complete talk show set up about mass timber. That's the word for it, mass timber. 
And I, I, I did have a conversation with uh, two, two guys who were, were architects and, and one was a, the head of the um, Carpenters Union. Uh, and they were both promoting this mass timber thing. So I've been trying to get an appointment with somebody who's, there's a whole institute at the University of Toronto on mass timber. And I really want to get an interview with it because look here, here's my understanding about uh, looking after climate change. The main thing you want to do is save old trees. You could cut trees and then replant them. And I just had this conversation yesterday with somebody else about it. If you, if you replant, if you plant new trees, they grow faster. So in a certain sense, I mean, I don't mean they grow faster. I mean, they, uh, they absorb more uh, carbon dioxide and, and, and then old trees. But, you know, this is a percentage basis. It's on, you know, if you're a little tree doing 10 times as much absorption as a big tree, you're still probably behind the amount of sequestration that the big tree does because it's so much bigger. So it can, you know, even if it does 2% of its mass with, uh, with capturing CO2, it's going to be, uh, do more than this little tree. So that's why I, I've, been, I've been told that you want to save old trees and you don't want to cut anything. But here, these people were being told that it's okay to cut out cut trees and make them into mass timber because that's better than concrete. Well, now I've got another story for you because concrete can be carbon negative. And there is a, an, an outfit in California that I've interviewed about carbon negative concrete. And so it would be a huge favor for the world if everybody start using concrete instead of wood. So, okay, now you can, you can tell me where I'm wrong. Well, trees are like us, they don't live forever. Uh, and uh, there is forestry management for that reason and to keep the forest floor healthy. Uh, and um, with the concrete uh, zero uh, carbon, uh, they use lots of extra energy to, to make that. Uh, they, they take the carbon that comes out the chimney and put it back into the concrete. So that's recycling. Uh, and they try to use fly ash and hemp and uh, slag in, in it. But it, the whole thing, concrete work is uh, lasts for a long time because it's hard to make, I think, <laughs> and uses a lot of energy. Uh, so uh, it's really good for foundations because uh, you know uh, animals can dig through it very easily. Uh, but uh, the uh, the wood is nice for up above the ground. But uh, you do need some concrete. Um, but floors, uh, for example, don't have to be concrete. They can be rock wool or some kind of um, uh, cellulose uh, packed to uh, provide the sound insulation between floors. Okay, they, I'm not saying they have to be concrete. I'm saying that the world would be better off if we would use, if we would switch to this carbon negative concrete and if we would use as much of it as possible, like build buildings just to build buildings because you wanna use concrete, more, 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 more concrete. And that's all I'm saying is that the more concrete you use, the more carbon you actually sequester because no. it's not just, yeah, it is, no, no, I swear <laughs> to God it is. It has really been demonstrated. This guy, Blue Planet, watch my show, he will explain it, it is, that the, the production of cement puts out CO2, yes, and because of the heat. But the way they are making the aggregate is carbon negative, and it's so carbon negative that it way offsets the amount of emissions from the concrete, from the cement manufacturer, so that the total amount of concrete that you produce is carbon negative. You actually see reduced and, and hidden into your concrete real con CO2 that would otherwise be in the air making greenhouse gas and, and yeah. heating the planet. Okay. This is an example of a kind of a, a myopia that I'm talking about. So if, if we just exclude other issues, then 
yeah, we could make everything out of concrete and we could be using all this concrete and we could take care of the climate situation just using the concrete, but we're using a finite resource. It's not going to last forever. So I I think there should be. Hold hold on. What finite resource are you using? You're using the aggregate and you're using the, the actual um, uh, Portland cement. Like none of that is, is infinite really recyclable so when, but, when but we're the talking- aggregate is what they make this ca- highly ca- carbon negative they suck the carbon uh, co2 out of the atmosphere and put it into a pipe or something and and this makes it into limestone pellets like this they but what effect does it. this have that on ecosystems it. so, uh, so it, when it's carbon negative it sucks co2 out but of that's carbon but that's carbon. So what impact does it have on ecosystems? What impact does it have on water? What impact does it have on air pollution? In uh, advanced building design, we're now using product specific uh, environmental product declarations or EPDs. And we're taking a look and making sure that our products don't have any unintended consequences mm-hmm. on the environmental system. So I think that, you know, as an industry, the the architects, designers, and construct, construction uh, companies should be looking together at how can we build and renovate buildings, um, not just you know so that it's low in body, body carbon, but it's also regenerating our ecosystems because our ecosystems have been impacted so badly over the last few centuries that what we want to do is actually regenerate ecosystems. I'm a big believer in in taking products that are part of the agricultural process and are wasted right now, either buried or burnt, and take those products and make them into architectural products. There's some people doing them with hemp right now in the States. So all of those products are carbon negative. It sequesters material that we, that we you know, as Westerners think of as waste, right? If you look at indigenous communities in North America, they didn't have such thing as waste. There wasn't anything that was wasted. There, if they had anything that was wasted, it would it would have been maybe the biochar that built up over you know centuries of being in one place, and it actually helped regenerate the soil. Like that's the type of wisdom that we need to apply to our systems and to our our design uh, strategies, so that we're working with the ecology and helping regenerate the ecology at the same time. If we keep going the way we're going, the way that we're treating soil like a dumping ground and way we're wasting fertile soil and the way we're building over it and subdivisions after subdivisions in southwestern Ontario, we're killing ourselves. We expect another 400,000 people, I don't know how many people we expect in GTA area uh, over the next decade and to house them we're paving over farmland that's unacceptable it's absolutely i i I agree with you i i i I really will insist however that before you trash this carbon negative concrete you have a look at it because if you can find if you can find any we have we have meta (laughs) i the world is running out of sand too uh, you can't yes. use beach sand and salt in it. Uh, there's, Honey, um, no, we're not talking about beach sand. We're talking about no, making... No, you cannot of, use beach sand, which I, they sometimes do in uh, uh, condos I, in Florida, uh, to I, make concrete. They, you, and me. we're running out of we're regular not, sand. When I'm talking about ca- carbon negative concrete, which is made of aggregate and Portland cement, Portland cement in the process will make some will emit heat and will emit CO2. It is on the other hand what they're doing with the what they're doing which is the aggregate is the great majority of the concrete is made of the aggregate which could be sand it could be rock it could be gravel it could be all kinds of things but in this case with the carbon negative it's a new con- kind of limestone that they create by taking carbon CO2 out of the atmosphere 
and making it right there into an aggregate called limestone pellets like that. And that is what they use with the carbon, with the uh, Portland cement to make concrete and the, t the, so the total content. Okay, I think you should go into business, Meta. Go into okay. business making but, concrete. I uh, want you to understand it. That's no, all I'm saying. I, I disagree I'm not, I mean, entirely. If, and, you can, uh, if you know this, if you understand this, then I'll leave you alone. But I'm saying what you're you talking about isn't relevant to what I'm talking about. It could be. Yes, we're on different planes. You're, you're uh, like, uh, I, I'm talking about personality. Is a new invention, and, 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 and it has been, they redesigned the San Francisco airport using concrete made this way. The stuff is produced right there, right by the place where the carbon is being emitted. And they capture it and they make the concrete that is carbon negative. Oh, like oh, carbon yeah. credits. Yeah, everybody wants yeah. carbon credits. I uh, know my, my is idea problem. is also... Uh, that um, th that uh, thinking about these things shouldn't be just uh, the technicians and architects on the job, but uh, now society is becoming much more educated like you are. And I would like to have meetings for designing buildings, even with the community, which is wonderful that Sandra is involving her community and local resources and, and making jobs. Uh, everyone should be part of this uh, educational process of architecture. Uh, whereas before it used to be, you know, you hire an architect, they design it and they build it, right? It, and then you complain about it's not very good. But um, I really like the idea that uh, peace can involve what they call the uh, integrated design process, uh, where they get uh, the trades and the local people and everybody involved before a building is built. Uh, to figure out what to do because oftentimes you know people have a rough idea um, build it in time uh, but the uh, just in time sort of building uh, and uh, it really comes up terrible and very wasteful uh, and also causes um, arguments like we're having now where people are lacking information so it, it gives us a chance to um, for everyone to uh, voice their ideas and I really like this idea of um, uh, architecture becoming involving everyone yeah, it's more like an orchestration of all these different parts, right? So if a good idea comes up, we can take a look at it and we can say, okay, well, how does that relate to this project? What what are the possibilities of it affecting this stakeholder that, you know, maybe it's an end user, maybe it's maybe it's the um a visitor to the to the building in the end, right? Like how are you? I know Harborfront years ago did a renovation and they did a carbon footprint calculation and their operations were minuscule compared to the, the carbon impact of all of the flights of all the people that came to visit Harborfront. So they said, how can we leverage our opportunity to have an impact on all those people that have already paid for the flights, have already spent all that carbon and now they're here in front of us now. And how can we have an impact on them? Like that's kind of thinking comprehensively about the whole system that's in place. Um, take a little idea and it can impact a whole project, right? I love the idea. You have a, an audience full of people who've flown in and you tell them what you should do is don't ever do this again. You should not take an airplane. So do not come to another one of these events that we're planning. You stay home and watch it on Zoom. Exactly. Exactly. I told them. Well, a lot of people don't even know that their their flights are having such huge impacts on 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 the planet. Like if they if they were to go to uh, projectneutral.org and do a carbon footprint calculation. Um, they can get some ideas of how to reduce their carbon footprint. They're a, a nonprofit that I worked with for years. I volunteered with them. And um, what, I've, what I found that really, you know, gets people talking is, is uh, you know, they, they want to do something, but they don't, they don't know where to start, mm -hmm. right? So um, when I'm talking to people who are, you know, owners of homes, and they, they want to do something, they see these utility bills, um, they have to go get an energy audit and energy audits are, are, um, you know, pretty hugely discounted right now. So they can go on the Enercan website. They can find a local provider of an energy audit. They can get a really 
um, great idea of where the weaknesses are in their um, in their home, and then they can get a plan to do a step by step renovation. And can, can you do it for free? I think on uh, Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation have a, a little chart you can fill in about your footprint for your house. Uh, yeah, there's yep it's for That's free. free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should pop that in the link at, um, as a comment on both your website page and, and YouTube. We'll, we'll pop some links in there for you. Yeah, put, put it on the comments column of this, this show because you can have a, a real conversation starting there because I, I, I want people to go and discuss these shows, you know, online after I post the, the edited version, which I will probably do tonight. Anyway, that's good. We'll put it there and people can go and have a look and make their own. Actually, it'd be interesting to have people post the results of their own calculations. You know, my mm -hmm. house uh, has, uh, what are the, some of the questions on it that they ask you to, to answer? Oh, uh, just the size of your house, the, the amount of windows you have, uh, um, you know, like just how many bathrooms you have uh, and you just check out everything. And then they'll, they'll give you some pointers and, it's all, all pretty much free. Uh, but uh, some people um, probably don't care about these things because they watch the HGTV show saying you got to open up your kitchen, right? Your kitchen's all in a small room. <laughs> you got to open it up to the rest of the house. So, and then they hire a structural engineer and say, whoa, we need a big beam up there. So anyway, they bring in this big expensive uh, steel beam uh, and then they got to fix the floor because the floor is all messed up. And, uh, you know, then while they're doing it, might as well new cabinets and uh, all these expensive things uh, that, uh, that money could better be spent in the third world for people that don't even have a kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it just uh, it, it, it just blows my mind when I, I see people say, uh, you know, I have to I can't uh, renovate because it's too expensive. It's less expensive to build new. That's what they say. And it's true. It's less expensive to build new right now. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, Sandra, what are some of the, uh, on, your, on this second book of yours, your handbook on uh, advice to homeowners on how to renovate, it sounds like maybe you, the first advice is don't renovate, give your money to somebody in the third world. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, part of it is really do you need that? Like there's a whole chap chapter on what do you actually need? Because a lot of people are driven to renovate, to create additional spaces for their family, um, for more private spaces, for less shared spaces. Um, they might put in an extra washroom so that the teenagers have a, their own washroom, right? Teenage kids. Um, and what I do in that chapter is I question their whole motivation behind renovating and how it's going to impact their carbon footprint and how it's gonna impact their family. As our homes get bigger, we get, further and further apart in our social glue. So um, it's, it's become a real problem because people think that bigger is better and that they're gonna have a, a happier family once they get that granite countertop in there. And when it comes down to it, um, what they actually need is a home that is the right size for them, that is uh, energy efficient and therefore healthy, um, and it's resilient to climate change. Like just look at what we've seen so far and what's coming down the pipe. Like why would you put in a granite countertop if you don't have a, a backwater um, valve on your sewage connection in your basement, right? So like where are the priorities? What's a backwater valve? Well, if there is a uh, it's large, not, it, it sounds kind of unpleasant. It's absolutely happening to thousands of families across the country. So what happens is we have combined sewer overflow. Um, when we when we built all these neighborhoods, we combined stormwater sewers with uh, with um, stormwater drains with sewers. And what happens when the stormwater drains get too fa far um, full? after large uh, severe rainfall events, um, it goes it goes and floods the sewers and then the sewers start getting over flooded and then they start backing up. They start putting pressure and filling people's basements, essentially, up to the level where they're full. So 
if if you go and and dig and put a put a backwater prevention valve on there you'll get a rebate from the city of toronto for doing it there's other cities that are kicking in rebates and it just means that on on those really heavy rainfall days you're not going to go home and find um you know a foot or two of sewage water in your basement okay and that's got to be the the most traumatic you know event for a family to deal with it it just is very impactful and and can be prevented but because of because of these tv shows and this whole idea of pinterest and design magazines and everything else you know just being focused on how everything looks people are overlooking the basics they're not they're not looking at their their family their home they're sitting in their home offices all day they're probably in their house uh 20 three hours out of 24 now and they're not looking at their air quality they might have crappy windows in their home that are condensing water on the inside um, there might be mold growing in their walls and they're you know here they are pinning pictures of granite countertops it doesn't make sense right all right you convinced me that's good i'm not intending to renovate anyway i'm in a high-rise building <laughs> you're fine yeah that's advantage of high-rise building too is it uh increases the density uh of cities uh and uh and i think there's more interaction happening in apartments maybe uh through zoom they can go with, meet with anybody in the world uh so i i really like the idea of trying to keep density downtown and i really get angry at them trying to spread have urban sprawl uh and uh you know with the big backyard uh, when we can share spaces mm -hmm. out, outside in parks. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's really annoying uh, to uh, watch people uh, waste the lovely land we have in North America uh, on uh, just covering it with the buildings and swimming pools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of mid-rise development. It's uh, purportedly the lowest carbon impact in both um, the uh, embodied carbon for the for the built form and ongoing um uh you know carbon use uh intensity for transportation and getting to different places as well you're in favor of what um mid-rise development what is that mid so it's, it's called it's also called the missing middle um so you have single family homes and then we have a lot of towers, 18 story, 22 story, 50 story towers in Toronto. Um, think of Paris, France, and how they have a lot of five to six, you know, four to six story buildings. Um, they're doing a lot of uh, four to six story passive house certified uh, um, multi-unit residential buildings in Spain now. Um, so they're they're at the, the height where, um, you can walk up if the power goes out for most people. Uh, you have um, a lower number of people in your community, probably about 200 people in your community instead of you know, 1800 people in your building. So it's, it's more, there's more social co cohesion. Mm -hmm. And then um, there, there doesn't have to be large infrastructure. So for example, uh, concrete cores to the towers. Everything can be, be made out of cross laminated timber instead of um, very minimal amounts of concrete in that. So that reduces the embodied carbon for those buildings. Well, we can go up to 30 stories with wood now. That's right. So uh, another question I get asked a lot for sustainable architecture is a green roof. I want to grow uh, uh, vegetables on my roof. Uh, so it's, uh, you just have to make sure that your structure is strong enough to support the um, water uh, that the plants need to grow. Uh, but it does help uh, uh, the climate uh, and makes your house not so hot and not so cold. Uh, and it's a heat sink for um, temperature that way. Uh, and I think it's also um, helps uh, looking after nature really helps people become more calm. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, looking after plants is uh, sort of nice uh, to be able to do, uh, even in the city or in mid-rise. Uh, and um, I think some people in the uh, suburbs uh, uh, just generally have time to mow their, their grass 
and that's it, right? So because I'm driving back and forth all the time in their cars. Uh, so I'm I'm really hoping that people will, uh, the Zoom is, is, is uh, COVID is actually good for keeping people at home and doing gardening. Uh, I guess we'll have a lot of great gardens next year too. If, if you were to ask me, an uninformed person, about what to do for the city, that's the best thing that could happen. It would be get rid of lawns and replace them with forests. It, urban forests is what I'm looking forward to. Within five years or so, most of us will not want to own a car anymore, uh, but we'll save a, about $5,000 per family per year by using driverless uh, taxis. And they will be much cheaper than, than ordinary maintaining a regular car. And so that means we won't need garages and we won't, and the car and the, we don't have to have carbon uh, parking places. Uh, Even along the street, there won't be any more parking because the taxis are constantly running. They don't stop. They just let you out and then they go on to the next thing. So they don't park. So all of those parking spaces along urban cities will uh, streets and the garages, uh, you know, parking uh, pads where people park their cars, that is going to be land that can be turned over to putting in uh, green things. And I advocate trees. So, but that's what- uh, That works in, a sun, in, in certain areas where you have the, the required threshold of density, but what happens in small towns? Like I, I grew up in a small city. I can't imagine that everyone there would be patient enough to, you know, wait for somebody to come and pick them up, wait for a driverless car to come and pick them up and, and take them to where they need to go to go grocery shopping. And then it would be there to pick them up when they came back. So like, I wonder what the threshold of density is going to be required. You know, my brother lives out in the middle of nowhere, so he's never going to give up his vehicle because there aren't going to be any driverless cars, you know, just wandering the countryside, ready to take him to the grocery store, you know, on that one day of the week or his, you know. They have uh, 15 minute uh, uh, villages now that they're working on. So uh, you'll be able to walk to your grocery store, to the pharmacy, uh, to basic uh, medical facilities uh, without having to drive anywhere. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I worked on it. If you do have to use a car, it's sort of like um, uh, ordering a taxi. Uh, I don't like the idea of having a driverless uh, taxi because then you can't talk to them about their haircut and the, you know, politics. I really enjoy um, if there are less cars on the road, there'll be fewer accidents too. But but let's go back to the built form argument when when we're talking about this, right? And the, the required density. So um, I worked with Peter Calthorpe on a prototype house in um, upstate, uh, uh, in, in Vermont, in a remote area of Vermont. And the prototype house was, was built, it was, you'll love it, uh, Meta. It was built out of concrete. It was designed to, ma- to last 400 years. It was before I became aware of, you know, fully aware of the embodied carbon. I, I did, you know, signal that to the design team that they needed to be thinking about that. But, um, but the idea was for these, the, these pilot, these uh, prototype houses to be in clusters and then those clusters to be in clusters and those clusters of clusters to be in clusters so that they were, they were connected by human powered um, uh, transportation between uh, the clusters so that everybody was in this, uh, what's called a transit oriented development that Peter Calthorpe developed a couple of decades ago, where you have more density, where higher efficiency transportation is available. So for example, your, your apartment building is, is pretty close to a subway line. So yeah, the density should be high. Um, And, and then my brother's place is not close to any uh, sort of, you know, high density transportation system. So it's okay that his density is really low and that's fine. He'll probably have a car um, for, for like forever, but where we get things wrong, <laughs> hopefully it'll be electric one day. Um, um, but where we get the things wrong is that we're, we're paving over uh, subdivision, like over 
agricultural land, that we're building these freestanding houses on that ar fertile agricultural land. And then we're not providing any transportation system for them. So we're, we're basically creating a legacy mm -hmm. of very high carbon intensity developments instead of building mid rises mm -hmm. and then providing um, transportation systems for them to get downtown or get to their job or get wherever they need to go. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, the, basically the mistake in low carbon design starts in the planning process and then it continues. The architect can only do so much. If they're given a piece of land with a certain type of zoning on it with only certain number of floors that are allowed to be created and a certain amount of, of um, development charges that are charged by the city. Like the development charges for a two bedroom condo are over $1,300 alone, right? I don't so, know what that means. What, 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 what is a development charge? So when, when a, a developer takes a, a site and then creates a, a condo development on it, they have to pay a tax to the city for having created that condo. It's basically, a, it covers infrastructure, library, fire, um, uh, education. It's, it's basically the, the foundation of city building, right? So I, I thought the owner paid taxes every year to cover those. But that's, that's ongoing taxes. These are infrastructure taxes for having, grow, having grown the city by okay. that amount. Okay. Which is terribly undervalued at that amount uh, because uh, the the destruction that they uh, uh, involve for the nature is uh, much more than that, uh, uh, and uh, really there's no excuse for uh, allowing uh, cities to expand beyond their green belts. Uh, and uh, I guess another question I get asked uh, is uh, with this uh, kitchen opening up business is uh, they get rid of doors too when they do that because uh, then the house becomes all open. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you can't keep uh, uh, warm air in a particular room or another room. We can't keep pets separate. Uh, you, uh, you lose a lot of control in your house once you take out the uh, the doors in the living area. So I, I really like the, uh, our uh, old, older folks living in regular farmhouses had good idea with, uh, you know, having the kitchen uh, sort of separated a bit and more to do with the outdoors. And also the other uh, question I get is about windows. Uh, the latest idea is like lots of glass, right? Lots of glass, especially on the South. You, know, you sit in this hot house with the yeah. sun coming in. Okay, I need an air conditioner now. Uh, and uh, we really need to design the different sides of the house differently. Like the south can have uh, sun, but you need a shade above it and trees in front of it. Uh, and the east and west are very nice. Except west, not so good for sunsets when you're already hot. Uh, and the north, like smaller windows. So uh, you get the artists uh, with a bit of north light. Uh, and uh, so often in apartment buildings, they're all the same on all different sides. You, I just can't believe it. Even the same type of glass. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's so true. And and then you you go and you you tell a, a client, well, um, yeah, you can you can build a passive house, but I need to help you find a, a a lot to purchase because you can't build a passive house that that um, uses eighty percent less energy to operate unless you have the proper orientation. You have to have southern exposure but not too too much like the deciduous trees on the on the south help you want to have northern exposure um and you don't want too much east and west because it will overheat um so it it's and then it comes back to the planning process of did they keep that in mind when they designed the suburb in in quebec i, I lived in Jonquière for for um uh, um, six weeks uh, in the early 90s and there was literally this suburb designed in in the suburb of Jonquière that had script written uh, that they used for the the letters of the street like they just wrote out this word and then designed the street to of all the houses to fit around this word so you can oh, no. see this word from from a plane but it absolutely okay. has no revel relevance on urban planning as a real planning experiment. Oh, um, 
And then well, you, have, you have contrast on, that. on stilts um, near uh, Quebec City, uh, up from the ground, and uh, they're in the trees so that they um, you can use a stack effect to get ventilation, and it protects you from the cold winds. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it, what is this? I am not. Well, you can ra raise your house up from the ground, like a lot of places do that in Toronto. The art gallery has up on the ground because they're supposed to be a park. And the sun's supposed to come in from the sides. Uh, it does a little bit. Uh, and uh, well, in this case, sometimes we have flooding in Montreal. So it makes a lot of sense for them to be up from the. They do that in traditional, for traditional housing in uh, Northern Australia as well in Queensland. All the houses are up on stilts so that when they have when they have breezes, the, the breeze runs under the house as well and, and through the house and keeps it more cool during the summer. Um, and it's also protected from uh, flooding uh, during hurricanes. Or Claire, uh, uh, were you, you, you say you, you like the idea of having the whole community involved in, in planning a project. Uh, well, it, in Montreal, we have a place called the Office of Consultation Publique de Montréal. So that uh, we have, uh, when people come up with projects they want to build, uh, they consult the whole community. Every have these big meetings, and uh, everyone's invited, uh, and they all talk about the, all the different aspects of it. It was really wonderful because they get so different ideas from lots of people, and and uh, they might even get some future clients that want to live there. So uh, I think it's a uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, informing the neighbors about what's happening. Um, I guess uh, before you didn't have to do that, right? Your land is my, that's my land, that's your land, you know. <laughs> but now, fortunately, we can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it sounds very good. To, to what extent is, is the developer listening with the intention of actually changing his plans um, if somebody comes up with a better idea? They have to. <laughs> It's uh, okay. the, written right in the, the planning department uh, mm -hmm. tells them what they have to build. Uh, and uh, sometimes, however, they convince the politicians that they'll make more money uh, with taxes if they let them go a little bit higher. Uh, and, uh, you know, like there's a little trade off here and there. But um, there is this process uh, that they have to go through. It's very expensive, like it costs them thousands of dollars for the developer. Uh, if, Nothing like that a little minuscule amount you would have to pay for services out in the countryside, but uh, it's uh, it really helps uh, coordinate the uh, development downtown, make sure they have parks uh, and um, proper uh, uh, use of materials. Also, the uh, uh, local people would see that something's being built and suggest, "I want use my material. It's right here." You know what occurs to me is that things are changing so quickly that what you do to plan for today is, is going to be, you're going to have the neighbors in to talk about their current problems, but they're not anticipating that what the climate is going to be 10 years from now, or that the fact that it may be not need a, a garage because they won't want to have a car 10 years from now, things like that. They're not foreseeing stuff. So I'm thinking your planning procedure should not just be based on current reality, but should take account of the changes that are coming. For example, I was, I was reading something by, a, it was actually Dorothy Golden Rosenberg's niece or a granddaughter who uh, works in Lyon, France. And, and they uh, were planting new trees along the boulevards but they had to take account not only the fact that you should have a diversity of trees and not all the same type, which they've had before, but, but the fact that the trees they're planting now are going to have to be ones that will survive. And with the, with the coming of the global warming, they are going to have to, they can't plant, plant the same trees that they're used to. And so they're looking around in North Africa for trees that will survive and so this kind of violates another principle, which is you don't want alien species. You don't want to bring in foreign plants. You want to use only plants that have always lived there. But you can't, because if you're really smart, you know those plants are going to live shorter and they're going to survive. So you need to bring in these foreign plants, right? Yeah, that, that's why we're, we're using future climate files on our design work. 
So when, really? when I was working on the Salvation Army um, new head office in Vancouver, um, uh, we were trying to pick a mechanical system to use in the, in the building. And I, and I brought up future climate and I said, we have to look at the humidity levels and the temperatures that we're going to face in Vancouver in 2035, 2045, because these mechanical systems are going to last 25 to 45 years. And we don't want to be having to rip them out um, 20 years down the road and then have to reinvest in all, all new mechanical systems just to deal with a new climate. So we ended up uh, bringing in future weather files into the, into the engineering of the, of the project and it influenced the, the building design. Um, we were also uh, um, future proofing the building by making sure that the um, ventilation system had a uh, high enough air, air filtration. They were only going to, to um, make certain parts of that building uh, um, protected uh, from wildfire smoke, uh, but um, all of the, the wildfires hit uh, Vancouver area in uh, 2020. Um, and that was during the mechanical design. So we decided to integrate um, higher levels of air filtration. And we also found out that year that COVID is airborne. Um, there's other uh, future pandemics that we're gonna have to worry about um, with airborne uh, viruses. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really building that into building design. None of that is in the Ontario building code into, in the BC building code, in the national building code. I'd really like to see that brought in so that we're not building something today that isn't going to perform tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me about what you need by way of ventilation, uh, because with the concern about airborne viruses, presumably it's not just the COVID. We, we've got who knows what's coming down the pike next. But uh, you, I guess you need a totally different uh, design for your air ducts and things like that. Well, well you can put a lot of mechanical systems in to try and protect yourself from the environment. But I think people like to open their windows uh, and uh, we need a certain amount of ventilation um, and uh, diseases a little bit around to uh, keep us uh, healthy. Uh, so uh, I'm really against this idea of over designing for future heat, because hopefully we can keep our cities cooler. Uh, by having less asphalt and uh, less uh, fewer cars uh, and um, turning the heat down. Like I have my uh, snowsuit here because it's winter uh, and I have my task lighting. And uh, if we can get people to uh, tone things down, settle down. You don't need to drive everywhere to go shopping. Just settle down. You can go walk to the store uh, and, uh, you know, like write a book with all the spare time you have. Uh, that uh, hopefully we don't need to have all this uh, 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 the, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning stuff that people want to send us and all these uh, sensors. Got a sensor as you go in the, the door, they're going to turn your light on for you. And, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, Honeywell's making a mint out of this greenwashing stuff. So I really am against spending all this money on these fancy things that need to uh, lots of rare earths to make them and their um, the equipment and mines in Africa. Uh, I really am against, uh, I like passive house. And I think that even uh, apartment buildings have a lovely shaft fact that they can just like, they don't need air conditioning if you design it right. I, I agree. You need to design it for natural ventilation, but you also need to shut it down and filter the air well, if you're having a pandemic situation, if you're having wildfire smoke with small levels of particulates, those, to, those types of, of air filters create a lot of resistance to airflow. So you need bigger fans, you need different size ducts, you're right, um, Meta, about the ducts. Um, you know, intuitively, it's, it's a different system, right? So I think as we, as we take our learnings from the pandemic, um, I think we should move forward with buildings that um, split up the delivery of heating and cooling from the delivery of air. That's probably the first mistake that we made in North America was you doing these um, mixed ventilation systems like our forest air furnaces. Um, and 
when we have really high performance buildings, the heating and cooling loads go down such that we can deliver all the heating and cooling that's needed with this fresh air ventilation. And that's the principle of the passive house. Work on me a little bit. My head needs help. Uh, you want to keep the cooling system separate from the air delivery system? Yeah, um, the cooling. So there, there's fresh air for air. Everybody needs to breathe. Yeah. And you need to get the humidity out from your showers, your cooking. Um, everybody breathes out humidity, right? Right. And all of that needs to escape the house. At the same time, you need heating to keep you warm and cooling to keep you cold. So it, a standard Canadian house has a um, an air vent underneath a window, and that that brings in fresh air. Your furnace is bringing in fresh air from outside, mixing it with the return air, and then re-delivering it to that living room. And we put it under the window because the windows are crappy and cold and big. And otherwise, we would be too uncomfortable to sit there. So well, put that aside. Imagine a well, can have under, underfloor heating. Sometimes uh, people have that also, which is better for it heating. Yeah. So take a passive house. It's like a super insulated thermos with air coming into it and air coming out of it. Mm -hmm. But the air coming in goes through the, the coffee cup thermos and comes out and it only goes in one direction. So you're never, you're never breathing air that was exhaled in the bedroom and then brought back into the furnace and then delivered to the living room. Okay. And in the passive good. house, it all works in one direction. You deliver the air to the bedrooms, you, you cross the hallways, and then you extract the air from the kitchens and the bathrooms. All right. Okay, now that's going to be better for our health. Yeah. It's not, I mean, how is it better in terms oh, of energy? It's, it's more efficient. It's more efficient for delivery because... Um, uh, the, um, the delivery system is a lot, is a lot more dense. So let's say we even go, we go that mid step and we deliver all the heating with, with mm -hmm. hydronic water is 10,000 times more dense than air. So it can be delivered a lot more efficiently. If we go to the passive house level where the energy is brought down so low, it's 80% more efficient than a standard house. If we go to a passive house level, we can heat and cool the air that's being delivered, and we only need a fraction of the amount of air delivered to those spaces. Instead of delivering large volumes of air, blowing and blowing to keep that window warm enough so that it doesn't have condensation on it, so that we're not sitting in front of it freezing. In contrast with that, with a small amount of air that's just heated and cooled enough that's slowly moving through the house and getting extracted. All right. I'll go for that. I, uh, it's very peaceful to live in. Like they're very quiet homes. Okay. They're very, very comfortable. All right. So I, I, I'm uh, grateful to you for this. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to renovate, so it's not totally yeah. relevant to me. But I hope it'll be relevant to a lot of other people who may learn something and decide to do it a little better. So maybe you'll get, somebody will get in touch with one of you or both of you. All right. Good. Thank you both. It's been fun. You take care now. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Meta. Bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week and sometimes more. This is episode 401. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to save the world.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. When you get to the website, do look around because we have conversations going on all the time about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, Enter its title or episode number in the search bar, or the name of one of the guest speakers. 
After you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your thoughts about the show with the other viewers. This is a place for dialogue, so please join in. See you there.